While almost everyone is sharing the most polished and curated versions of themselves, making sure we find our light, that the filter is right, the hashtag is tight, check out my gig from last night, and the sandwich I ate after all in one bite, Braxton Cook is asking, who are you when no one is watching? Actually, as it turns out, it's a question he's asking of himself. And in a somewhat postmodern and ironic twist, he's doing it publicly and on his new record called Surprise. Who are you when no one is watching? Which comes out this week. Welcome to the third story. I'm Leo Sidrin. Braxton Cook is an artist of his time. That is, he's hard to define, hard to categorize. He's overqualified, determined to share his most authentic self, prepared to be vulnerable, and in a constant state of searching. He's a Juilliard-trained saxophone player who's worked with jazz artists like Christian Scott, the Christian McBride Big Band, John Batiste, and Marquise Hill, as well as more mainstream artists like Solange Knowles and Tom Misch. He's also a deeply sensitive solo artist. He's a singer, a songwriter, a producer, and a multi-instrumentalist who's committed to keeping the saxophone alive in soul music and to speaking his own personal truth in his songs. He bridges the gap between jazz and soul and alternative R&B. So, you know... Basically, he's a millennial guy, which maybe explains why one of his earliest records was called Millennial Music. What you hear behind me is Indy, one of the instrumental tracks from his new record. We spoke recently about his trajectory, starting out on the local scene in Washington, D.C. as a college student. He spent two years at Georgetown University before transferring to Juilliard to pursue his jazz education. We talked about his evolution from soloist to singer, sideman to leader, and son to father. The value of nostalgia and deep emotional connection in his writing. We talked about intentionality in raising children, his determination to make music with impact. We talked about where he cut his teeth and if that has anything to do with his lifelong fascination with dentistry. Braxton is on tour this spring. You can visit BraxtonCook.com for all his dates. And guess who else is heading out on the road this spring with a new record? It's me. My new project, What's Trending, comes out on March 10th. And I'll be at Rockwood 3 and NYC for the album release on March 10th with a killer band and a bunch of special guests. And then I'll be in Europe for most of April with my groovy French band. Check out my artist website, leosidrin.com, for those details. More websites for you. Third-story.com is the place to go to sign up, subscribe, visit the archive, check out the sandwich I ate in one bite. You know this. Hundreds of conversations with brilliant and creative people are there for you. Then it's patreon.com slash thirdstorypodcast where you can go to do whatever you want to do while no one is watching. And it's wbgo.org slash studios, where you can check in on my good friends and partners at WBGO. And please consider leaving a review or some stars on Apple Podcasts. Here's me and Braxton Cook talking it down. Man, Braxton mm -hmm. Cook, I'm so happy to meet you. You know, your name has been floating around in so many worlds. Your, your name is floating around and, it's, and it's, it is hard to f even figure out where to put you, you know? Yeah, that could be a good thing or bad thing, but uh, <laughs> I take it as a compliment. And that's uh, because, yeah, I man, I've just worked with a lot of different artists, I guess, uh, with a lot of different musicians. And I know I've started in a very traditional jazz sphere, right? Um, you know, studying at Juilliard and then even, you know, working with Christian Scott, Donald Harrison, and, and, and you know, what John Batiste and Christian McBride, and some of these like, you know, more traditional jazz artists. But I've just always had interest musically in other spheres uh, that were basically um, that's kind of, you know, branches off of the tree of soul and, and, and black music, like R&B and gospel and, and all these other styles of music, hip hop, you know, uh, I've always grown up listening to all these different styles of music in my house. Um, and I think, you know, upon moving to New York and just hanging out with with a lot of different artists and musicians in my generation i just started to want get in touch with all of the styles that i just grew up on um that i felt truly made me feel whole mm -hmm. um musician as a person I'm fortunate to be able to actually do that i guess i read that you heard grover washington play the solo on just the two of us and that was mm -hmm. the thing that got you excited about playing saxophone and and ultimately yeah. where where you are right now Mm -hmm. makes perfect sense when you think that's the thing and that was the context in which you heard the saxophone and you were like that's what because it was in popular music it wasn't in instrumental music Thank you. 
I did not hear, even though I've grown to, I, I love it and obsess over Cannibal Island and Car- Charlie Parker now, but no, I was not 10 years old and I didn't hear a Charlie Parker solo and then say, that's what I want to do. It, was, it wasn't that it was a, a, through a period of, of, of researching and studying the, the influences that Grover Washington had that I then found those geniuses and architects of the music and art form. But no, I think it, yeah, it was a, it was just the two of us, and it was a, that tenor solo that that Grover Washington took, and I found that he even wrote the tune. Um, and I was even more impressed by just like yeah, the, the composition, songwriting, and ability to 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 really write as well. And then um, other artists like Michael Brecker, even like I, hearing cameos, Candy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That solo was crazy. Um, and then again, delving into his influences and finding Coltrane and Sonny Rollins is one of his huge influences and becoming then obsessed with Sonny. Um, yeah, it, it was a lot of R&B, really, a lot of R&B and soul music uh, that featured horns and featured in particular saxophone that just stuck out to me. You know, I got three brothers and we all listened to the, some of the same music in the household back in the 90s. But it's but for me, the horn solos, I would... Uh, I'd, I'd have them memorized, you know, I'd, I'd love those parts. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes I find myself forgetting the lyrics and stuff to the song, but remembering the sax solos and remembering Earth, Wind and Fire horn intros and and things like that, right? And eventually like, through studying and learning those lines and, and then finding, you know, a lot of the jazz musicians that influenced these, those artists. So you grew up in the DC area, right? Yeah, exactly. Suburbs of D.C. So I grew up in Prince George's County, like in Greenbelt, Maryland. Um, and then for a short while, moved to Atlanta from like 2000 to 2005. Hmm. And you know, my family moved down there. And how old were you at that at that time? And I was, so I was 91, so nine, 10 years old. Yeah. I moved down there fifth grade through eighth grade. And it was a very, you know, pivotal time, honestly, for me. That's actually where I got into music that's when i first joined band class you know down in atlanta in fifth grade and in the middle school found you know i started delving more to the r&b stuff like i'm mm-hmm. like i was saying and then eighth grade i think i joined a little jazz club in, in eighth grade where we played some holiday christmas music you know deck the halls and kind of you know stuff like that for like a winter concert it was the first time i think i ever really checked out jazz and the band director in eighth grade was was actually a jazz musician and uh, I remember, he, yeah, he scheduled a, you know, it's one of these assemblies where like the, the local high school, which was uh, North Springs High School, came to my middle school, which was Sandy Springs Middle School, and did a little master class. And it was cool to just see high schoolers also playing mm-hmm. jazz at that time, right? Because, yeah, as a kid, sometimes you just need to see someone that looks like you doing something. And that, and that, that had a lasting impression on me. Um, and then shortly thereafter, I moved back to Maryland, this time not Prince George's County, but Montgomery County. And I moved to, um, I went to uh, what's it called, Springbrook High School. It was Wyman Jones, was my band director. And uh, I then met Paul Carr. And then anyone from Maryland, D.C. area, you know, needs to know Paul Carr is uh, just a, a legend and uh, truly a genius in jazz education. Like, like really brilliant guy and great dedicated um you know, educator. So Paul just got me, you know, on the on the straight and narrow as far as just like transcribing Charlie Parker and Cannonball Adderley learning lines, learning by ear, you know, and he's in and and leading me along the path of like, like really being a jazz musician. Do you, you know I had heard that you grew up outside of DC and that you stayed there for college before you transferred and that your father was a professor and you know I, I had this general sketch, but I didn't know the Atlanta piece of it and Forgive yeah, I don't me. talk about it a lot, but yeah, it was it was important. I just almost wonder if, like, I mean, I know DC is the South. It is, yeah. But I wonder if spending those kind of middle school years in Atlanta actually, mm-hmm. you know, also 
I don't know if you would have like heard different music or if it, you think it would have come out the same way either way. You no, know, it, it wouldn't have been some of my most. It's funny that yeah, some of my, my largest musical influences now that maybe you even hear my music all kind of happened at that time. Yeah. Also, it was an, it was a boom in in Atlanta's music in that period of time. This is like bone crusher came out we're talking outcast is at its prime i think love below dropped in 2003 which changed my life i heard yeah andre benjamin just kind of melding all of these forms of music all in one like on that album you know my favorite things is over a break beat So I'm hearing Coltrane. Oh, you know, I'm hearing all of these influences of music, but melding together in a way that I thought was super unique. And it just early on, she told me like, yeah, these lines don't need to exist, you know, because uh, so, so that, that had a huge yeah. influence on me musically. Right. And then, like I said, the R&B, I heard uh, Confessions. I think Confessions dropped around then. Usher's killing it. J.D., J. Jermaine Dupri is just dropping incredible music and so like that has a huge influence on, on, on me as well just like musically and orally and singing uh just, like i've always got like, kind of grown up in the church and my dad also is a pastor went to harvard divinity like you know christianity is a very big part of just how we were raised so with that the, the music you know is a huge part of worship right so yeah some of the churches down south are just mega church it's just yeah. like it's the culture is huge so like that has a huge influence on me um, also, my family's from the South. My parents are high school, like high school sweethearts from Magnolia, Mississippi. So it was very much closer back, you know, close to family, closer to family, and close to just that culture that they grew up on. Um, and then uh, also then at that time, I think John Mayer, man, was dropping some crazy, just like dropping, gen- like, you know, he was dropping classics at that time. No, you know, no such thing. And Daughters and uh, some of those records were just had a lasting impression on me. I remember he wrote that song. I've been driving down 85 and da, 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 da. you know, why Georgia? Why Georgia? He, why Georgia? So yeah. I'm in Georgia, you know, like yeah. it just really connected with me. I'm driving 85 in the kind of morning that lasts all afternoon. I'm just stuck inside the groove. You know, so it's, I think it's no surprise that, you know, years later, I tried to blend all of this folk, pop, country, soul, R&B, and jazz, and it's just, it's all in my ear. But you decided not to pursue music in college originally. You came from an academic family. Maybe there wasn't... Oh, and sure. it, My it, parents both went to Princeton, and the bar was high, you know what I'm saying? And and still is, uh, It's it, in, the, in the sense that... that even with with the music that I make, it's my you know a lot of our conversations are always on the why the the the, the impact it has, the socioeconomic kind of impact, the conversations around it, the meanings behind things. So like that was that's always been implanted in it. I never you know I feel like I still I don't make music for the sake of just making music. It's it's always been a deeper thing, um, and how it has to intersect with something uh political social you know what i'm saying you know what i'm saying yes, these I kind do. of larger how it functions in society and and, and things like that so I, I think you know i very much appreciate that now at the time you're younger your brain is fully formed you see things in a very myopic kind of way and i'm just like no i just want to play saxophone um but yeah come senior year of high school i had done what young arts and i had done uh, grammy band uh, where you know I'm playing with some of the better musicians in the country, done the all county, all state stuff a few times, and I think it really came down to like a find a pretty frank financial decision. <laughs> because <laughs> it gave you dad. full gave you full ride if you stayed in DC. 
Yeah, well, yeah, it's a it's a benefit part of the just yeah. kind of academic benefit. My dad was able to negotiate uh, where all of his children would go to Georgetown for free. And I was like, you know, and I get it. Like my wife is a professor at LMU now, and like there are all these amazing little benefits sometimes that come through, mm-hmm. you know, your offer and what all of that, right? So, you know, at the time I think I was thinking I just wanted to go to New York and go play. And I got into, yeah, you know, how all these, you know, a lot of great HBCUs yep. and then Georgetown, Howard, University of Maryland, New School, uh, Manhattan School of Music, all these places. But it, it ultimately came down to, you know, my dad was like, look, you want to take out loans to go mm-hmm. to New York? Look, man, I think you should maybe do this. And I was like, all right, all right, all right. You know, I didn't want to hear it, I think, at 17, but I, I'm so glad. It's so, interesting, man, because, you know, in the end, his strategy, whether or not he knew it, paid off you got into school you started and then you were able to transfer oh yeah perfect it's one of those things where god's playing like it really is larger than you can see at the time yeah uh that, it's a that's a huge theme on my record even yes. that tune let go yes let go and let god you plan and God laughs because there's so many times that I've seen it in my life where I, I envision something happening a certain way and at a certain time. <laughs> and and, and it, it always works out in a, in a different timeline, but, it, but oftentimes a lot better than I first imagined. And uh, yeah, I'm very grateful for my t- those two years in DC because I not only did, you know, um, be going to school for free, give me leverage later on in my negotiation, but it also afforded me just a lot of performance. Uh, opportunities in in a smaller market than New York, where I'm like, yeah, 17, 18, 19, getting to play now with all of these incredible musicians in DC that are way older than me, schooling me on tunes and like getting me to run jam sessions and then getting, building my confidence up as a, just a performer and artist in the city, building a name a bit. And yeah, I learned a lot of tunes. I played a lot of different shows and a lot of different gigs and I've played for I mean, 18th Street Lounge used to be this crazy gig I'd play it. On the top floor. The top floor had top the music. Top floor, bro. It was yeah. crazy. You know what I mean? I would see some wild stuff up yeah. there, too. And I was like, you know, it just really trial by fire, just trying to figure stuff out up there. But, uh, I, you know, I grew up a lot in, in D.C. Uh, musically. Uh, learned a lot of music, like a lot of different styles of music. And then made a lot of really cool relationships. Chris Fun was a really, was an early one, you know, who was torn with Kenny Garrett at the time. But to get to play with with him all the time and talk with him and hang with him. And then same with what, Ben Williams and me and Salim, all these people that would come mm. through. Uh, and, and then they, they were all working as well with large artists. So Chris Bond used to work with Chris Christian Scott. So it was like one of the first times I got to hear about him. And then me and Salim was playing with Roy Hargrove. So Roy Hargrove would come through D.C. all the time. And boom, they're, they're playing it on U Street. You know, and then I get to come in and get to hang out. And I got to play with Roy on a couple of tunes back then. Like, you know, just things like that. You know what I'm saying? The, uh, yeah, DC was it was a it was a beautiful two year period that yeah. really got me ready. I felt like for New York. Um, I, I like the way you describe also understanding like what the life of a musician would be like and how music works in a community independent of I, going to school and all that. Like seeing it in action first, as opposed yeah. to going to school for it and then figuring that out. Right, and I couldn't imagine it any other way. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm like, wow, like I. I really got to see how that how it works, the economics of it, the yeah, the, the politics of it, the everything, yeah. like the real scene. And then you then you go to school, and I was like, oh yeah, I've never learned solfege before. Mm-hmm. Let me like let me learn this stuff. You know what I mean? Juilliard like really pushed me in a lot of ways for sure. I got my skills to a certain level. Yeah, uh, but yeah, but that that performance and work experience is like yeah, bar none. Like you can't get that anywhere else, but the, but like the street, really. <laughs> you know what I, I mean? Totally. I, but and I saw you said in another interview that Samora Pinderhughes called you, and that's p- part of what motivated you to oh, go to no, New York. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's no. It was it was Luke Salenza, but Samora was there. Uh huh. So yeah, no, no. These were um. 
again, how I said I did Grammy Ben and, and mm-hmm. Young Arts. So these are guys that I knew that were like from all over different, you know, states. So, so they're from Cali, I yeah. guess. And then Luke is from New York, but we had done Young Arts together, you know, while I was in high school. Um, or rather, I was already a freshman at Georgetown, but yeah, we, we knew each other. Yeah. And they had gone on to pursue music school straight out of high school. Then I went to Georgetown to study English, African American studies, blah, blah, blah. I get a call though from Luke just checking in, you know? Um, and it, it was my birthday as well. So maybe it was actually, he was like, hey, happy birthday, blah, blah, yeah. blah. You're not going to believe who's here. Josh Crumbly's here, some more, but all these people. And I was like, oh, cool. What's up, guys? How y'all doing? They're like, bro, you got to come to Juilliard, man. I was like, for real? Like, I mean, we'll see. We'll see. They're like, no, really, just apply. And at the time, there were like the Reard and Anderson twins were there. They were great They're from Maryland, but they were graduating. Eddie Barbash was there, but I think he was leaving. Yeah. And they were like, I think there's an opening, bro. I think you should really apply. So I did. Only school I applied to transfer just to see, you know, and and yeah, I got in. Everything worked out. Like I said, match scholarships and, and it seemed like everything just kind of aligned. You know? Yeah. So as you were then embarking on what followed, where you, mm-hmm. you know, you really made a name for yourself as a jazz musician, working with Christian Scott, working as a sideman in other projects, even making your own solo records where you were, you know, you, I can see you trying on try, like different combinations of elements in the development. Like, well, what if it's a little more electronic or what if even like the first time you sang, it seems like on a record, it was still in a more acoustic context. You know, it was like, okay, yeah. I'm going to make a jazz record, and but I'm going to sing, but it's still, don't worry. I'm st- it's still, everything feels live <laughs> still, you know. I can't go on now without you by my side. I can't go one day from wanting your body next to mine. All day, all night, I'm thinking. Like at, at what point are you starting to think, okay, I think I, I think I maybe want to switch this up a little bit, or I think I maybe want to try to like actually be a, a, a performing singing artist and, and songwriting artist in that way. It's, it's just been such a slow, gradual process, man. I don't know if it's ever been a premeditated thought. It, it's been, a, I guess it's, it's, I should say it's been just a steady and slow, um, evolution or progression i've never really thought of myself any different hmm. but certainly uh, looking back the uh, the output yeah has definitely changed and evolved in the sound as well but um yeah i don't know if there was any ever a conscious choice it, it, it it's just been fire sign for sure was like the most r and i've ever done and and, and the most a, a project where I, I sang the most and I- In my head, I think I, I've always thought of it percentage-wise for sure. It's like how much is instrumental, how much is vocal, yeah. Um, and and what do I want people to walk away, you know, seeing and feeling? Like it's it pretty split down the middle. Is it is he more this? Is he more that? Um, and I've always been like I said, you know, somewhere in between is is a tune, but also very much a mission statement. And then I really feel, you know, that I I, I, I like to exhibit you know, sound, the sound of both of these styles and try and blend them the best I can that feel natural to me. Yeah. Uh, but I guess as my, as my, I've gotten more confident and, and, and confidence really just comes from just doing it more often, just getting more reps in like anything else, like I did on the saxophone. I've certainly gotten a little more comfortable saying like, oh yeah, no, no I, I sing. Yeah. I, I do. This. You know, it wasn't always that way. I used to just feel like, oh yeah, I play saxophone. I'll sing a little bit, but now I'm like, no, no, I, I, I'll do both. Um, I appreciate that you that you are trying to make them and you are making them live in the same world because I think for years what I've seen with my jazz musicians them yeah forcing yeah. them yeah squeezing them Damn. together yeah like literally yeah like even in my track listing now we're gonna yeah. go from a sweet ballad to like boom my balls and wall sax but yeah. it's like sometimes you things are you got to sometimes that's that's just the art of it all is is that kind of rough around the edges um, approach I try 
So that's something I've thought about for sure. But. You know, a lot of times when instrumental artists make music that is influenced or in reaction to what's happening in the world or making a political statement or whatever, it's abstract because, I mean, you can feel it sometimes in the music. You can feel music is angry or music is elated yeah. or whatever. But when you're singing about something, it's much easier than to say, no, it's clearly I'm talking about something. I'm, I have a message that's deeper than just, as you say, than just like chops. Mm -hmm. yeah. And considering how mission oriented it sounds like you have been and felt like you have to be making music for a higher purpose other than just like that it sounds cool you know maybe allowing yourself to sing also gave you a lot more flexibility in terms of how you were able to to do that if that makes any sense you know that you had things to literally say with words absolutely and uh, yeah it's 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 afforded me definitely some responsibility i mean some some flexibility with yeah how to how to go about that it's also it's funny as a Freudian thing but yeah. maybe that's true it it there's a responsibility as well that comes with that and a uh, vulnerability and just like, wow, now you really out of here, man. Like, you know what I mean? It's, it's a, it's a pressure that comes with that as well. I'm like, Whoa, you can feel oftentimes artistically and musically so bare uh, in, in that kind of, yes, yeah, as a singer, it's in a uh, man, so much work that comes with it. It's crazy and discipline and, and, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, but it, I'm centered by the fact that I'm just, I, 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 I try and just be as honest as possible. I try and grow and get better every day. And, and vocals are one of the most exposing things you can do. It's, uh, yeah, it's difficult, but, and same with songwriting. It's, it's, it's so, you know what I mean? Even this album, I really try and be as, try to, I, I journal, I try and be as cathartic as I can while writing these, you know, writing out this, how I feel and, and, and what I'm going through and what I'm experiencing. And then to try and transform some of those things into song is a very vulnerable kind of thing. Uh, and to put that into words and share that is like, oh my goodness, it's a lot. But yeah, it's like, I feel like that's important because I feel like I felt that that's what was missing in my, amongst my, a lot, some of my peers while I was in school. Uh, I've been surrounded by a lot of incredible talent and, and incredible music and, and musicians and work ethic, but de definitely that piece of sharing your emotion and sharing who you, who you really are uh, is a scary, daunting task and uh, i think as an artist that's like that's the thing you gotta dare to do because most people really that's the part that people are connecting to in the first place yeah. the humanity you know so why hide behind our technique when we could lead with our heart and with who we are you know what i mean it's scarier in a way but i've always been that way and i, I want to lead with that and i feel like that's a uh, while a lot of great artists do, I just feel like as a, you know, a lot of my musician friends, like we could, we, I want to lead us in that way and in, in that particular way, like let's, you know, let's lead with that. Yeah. Well, it seems like you are very driven by, motivated by, called to the emotional aspect in music. Yeah, absolutely. Connecting with emotion. Yeah. It, it, it always has been that in church at home, the, the songs that I, I like. I've always uh, yeah, pulled that out of me. I've always connected to those, yeah, the deeper kind of emotional elements in music for sure. Um, while all of I'm so also still connect, you know, cerebrally and, and yeah. intellectually and musically. I love those, that part of it. And some about even that time in Atlanta, like we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of that music that I listened to then, I um, mean, like Why Georgia or like, I love a lot of Emily King's music that I've discovered later. And it's like, it connects to this nostalgic kind of, melancholic thing that uh, just, just hits me deeply and I write a lot of music from that space I use chords that speak to that I like a lot of you know flat nine and th flat 13 kind of chords that give me th those feelings like they're musical devices but ultimately unlock certain emotions to me in my mind based off of whatever sensory memory I have minor major chords and certain things that just feel like a blend of happy and sad obviously the blues they're just things like that that i, I really like yeah well you put out a single last year that's on this record called the 90s i want to love you like the 90s oh yeah 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 for sure for and, sure oh man deep one I, well i want i want to talk about it you know i was thinking about like when i first started when i started i was like what do you remember from the 90s really like <laughs> you know i knew you're gonna say that like, <laughs> you don't remember nothing from the 90s right but yeah. that's the point. It's like it's a nostalgia for something that you mm -hmm. kind of, it's almost like it doesn't matter if you fully experienced it or not. It's almost a longing for the thing that you didn't experience. Man, I if know. I can get real though, it's like a feeling that I felt growing up. 
yeah like a it was just a period of time that i felt so much love in my household even you know what i'm saying yeah um that yeah. i think as we got older the life gets more difficult you know uh things between my parents got a little more difficult and in in, in some ways it's it's about yeah topically certainly about the the art and the film and all these incredible advances that I feel like we, you know, we made, uh, like, I mean, we grew up, my dad's a huge film buff. We grew up watching like Spike Lee films yeah. and, you know, eyes on a prize and all these incredible, you know, pieces of, of, of film and, 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 and art and shows and music and everything that was seemed to be progressing um, in the nineties. Uh, but um I think, yeah, personally, on a deeper level, it, uh, in my head and in my heart, it just felt like, oh, man, such a good, happy, beautiful time uh, during my, my adolescence. You know, you can feel it as a kid. You know what I'm saying? And uh, yeah, we've had periods, I feel like, late, you know, after after that, that maybe weren't so, that we got a little, little rocky. So, so to some degree, I think it's, yes, about the time in general for everybody, yeah. but then personally for me, like, nah, like, it was, it felt like happy times. It was like before you realized that things could be upended, that this could be broken in some way. And then we moved, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. And to some degree, even our move to Atlanta was like kind of a in two thousand was kind of like an end to that saga mm -hmm. and to that that period of time. And I think that yeah, it's yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. There's something there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that's so. That song is kind of both uh, both about what I went through personally, but then also like, yeah, the '90s were fly and they were dope and they were great, and the movies mood were, were beautiful, and Black Love was like yeah. highlighted in such a beautiful way. Thank you for being real about that and sharing that with me. And and also, you know, it's so interesting how things like that can ha can operate on on multiple levels. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, absolutely. You know, th that's your personal truth, but it's also and that's what they always say about writing. The secret to writing is like, you know, your personal truth will resonate as more universal. Mm -hmm. In the video, there was this other piece of it that I loved, which is like these just little subtle things, like all the tropes of those videos of like, yeah. <laughs> The silk shirt buttoned all the way up. Come on, bro. I was on my, like, bleak. I was on my, uh, that spike. That was from, like, Mo' Better Blues. <laughs> exactly. Oh, totally, man. And also, the wine, always red wine, filled, deeply filled, <laughs> what, big wine glasses filled That's with wine. That's hilarious. that. Yes, bro. I was like, is anyone going to drink? I was actually drinking. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. That was we always, like, that was the image of sophistication and elegance. And there it was in the video. And it did evoke, even though I was like, he was, like, five years old when this stuff is good. But on the other <laughs> but, hand. yeah, I grew up watching all this yeah. stuff, Boomerang. And, yeah. like, yeah, it's sure, sure. And also on the record, you know, you talk about, though, literally you talk with your parents about, like, you're not just burying this stuff in the songs. Then you, you like, open it wide open and you interview them about mm -hmm. how to keep love going and what happens in relationships and life. I mean, you brought that yeah. right into the project. Yeah, man, I wanted to... Well, with their permission, of course, I wanted to, to yeah, just share a bit more of, like, who I am. And in order to do that, you got to explain and maybe just showcase like where you came from and who you came from. Yeah. And My point is that you guys are doing the work you need to do for yourself all along the way in your relationship and to it as parents as well. And that way you will find the time to do the balance because I do think it's important to continue to cultivate your life and your passions and what you want to do. Yeah, I've got two incredibly beautiful, intelligent parents that, against all odds, you know, beat mm -hmm. beat all the statistics you can think of to leave Magnolia, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. You know, go to to this at Princeton, Mary, 
mm. for 30 plus years and raised four, you know, black men mm. that have all gone on to, to lead incredible, you know, pretty successful lives. Um, it's, it's, a uh, it's, it's just an incredible blessing and it's it's a it's a plan that they you know really set out to accomplish and you know i'm just incredibly honored and and as a, as a new father you know i'm just like inspired by by that and the intentionality that went into everything you know it's so it's so much work i was going to ask you that you know i'm a father too and when i hear stories like that i immediately check myself and think am i intentional even like to to a percentage of what that is, like the, the amount of work and determination and agreement, this is what we want to make and create for our children. Like, I don't know if I am that intentional in the choices that I make. All you can do is, you know, asp aspire to yeah. to do that and to, you know, meet at least a, a piece of that. Uh, but yeah, you know, I'm like, it's just, it's just, I just feel so incredibly blessed, man. And uh, it's just, I think I might even said at, at the end of the record to my dad, like it's, that it's just like, yeah, I'm just so, so blessed. And that like, this didn't happen by mistake. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, you prayed on this, you prayed on, on us every day and planned for, for a lot of this and a lot of the, you know, and helped to provide, you know, and, and help to like strategically cultivate our passions and do what we needed to do to get here, you know? I definitely, I specifically remember being like in martial arts, basketball, music, and all these different things at like eight, nine years old, you know? Yeah. Uh, and all of us, and then seeing kind of what stuck. And my baby brother, it was sports. He went D1. My, me and Brendan, the middle kids. Uh, Brendan goes by Star Child, but he's an incredible musician and artist and works with Solange and now Maggie Rogers. And he's just great. Went to school for drama. So we've had, you know, we've been blessed to be able to do what we love. And then my older brother is just a yeah, consultant. And he's just killing <laughs> But like, um, yeah, like this, this was, this was thought about planned and, and, and executed on and he instilled in us like just a, a great drive. I think both my parents and remind us where we came from. Like shit, my dad's house was like the size of this room, you know? Yeah. So, how, and then, so how does that as you, because you have a young child, right? Like a couple of years old, maybe almost yeah, a year and a half, just about, that's my, that's my guy, August, August. August. Hey, that's my boy, August. Congratulations. I, I, saw, I saw on your Instagram. That's how. Oh, and it's also, uh, is it not the cover of the album? For so, sure. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. He's on the album album cover. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, so that's, you're very forward about it. You're very outward about it. Like, I, you know, you have a child, you, you, you know, married, celebrate your family, put them on the cover of the album. Yeah. 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 I know. I know. It's rare. I, yeah. Yeah. It's rare. It's rare in that, in, in the sense that, like, I do feel like in the industry, it seems almost like, oh, people don't do that. But it just feels right to me. What, like where I am in this 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 part of life for sure. It's been a huge transition, you know what I mean? From my record in 2020 to this, it's like so much has happened. I moved across the country, got married, and and had a child, bought a house, all this stuff that comes with it. Um, it's been a, a really yeah a big transition. But did you well. move because your wife had the job? Mm -hmm. And are you in LA? Yeah, I'm in LA. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think New York and LA were kind of the two places I always yeah. you know wanted to be. I always envisioned a bi-coastal life at some point that we talked about like years ago. Cause like I, my wife's from Cali, you know yeah. what I mean? So I met her in 2012, I think in the back of my mind, I'm like, Oh yeah. Cause I've been coming out here for holidays for yeah. years. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I think I had always known at some point we're going to make it out of here. Um, yeah. She finished up her PhD, her doctorate program over at Princeton. We were, yeah. we were living in Jersey in 2019 and then she finished up like um, in 2020 and we were like, went on the market and I think her, a few offers she got were just like in Cali. From your point of view, like what's the, you know, what's the, obviously it's a very rich and exciting time. Also be doing what you're doing in LA probably makes more sense for you to be in LA with the kind of music you're making right now. That part, that part, man. It's like, yeah, again, it's how so many things align, you know, yeah. that, that seemed almost out of your control, yeah. but, but feels destined. Uh, LA, I mean, you could talk about on one level, just like the, the Hodge, it feels like a lot of just artists made during the pandemic to like to LA. Everyone's like, I'm getting up out of New York, getting out this tiny apartment. Um, you know, the prices are too high. It's just crazy. I want to go out to the beach and then <laughs> go on some hikes and stuff and just see something different. So, and particularly at my age, you know, I, I turned uh, 30 when we moved out here. So it was just like, I feel like a lot of people felt like, all right, I've done my 10 years in New York, 10 years plus. And uh, I'm going to go try something different. So a lot of my friends and band members actually moved out here yep. and uh, 
we hang and play all the time. You know what I mean? So I, I, it hasn't felt like a uprooting in in that sense, which I think initially I had feared, but now I just feel like a kind of natural evolution. Yeah. Like now we're right here and we just link up and, and make music and it's a little more spacious and sunny. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's, but uh, so it felt like the right time in a lot of ways. Um, and then, like you said, like industry wise, like Jesus, Grammy week was crazy. So much going on here. I'm um, in a different, in a di- very different kind of way. Um, almost like the the politics and stuff of the, the the industry. There's a lot a lot more of that happening. But um, now that I'm delving more into songwriting and, and and producing, and one of my best friends actually, John Sweet, we went to we were roommates at Juilliard. You know, he's really um, I don't even know if he plays very a lot of jazz piano anymore. You know, that's what he got a degree in. He's really producing a lot more now, and he's pretty deep into like uh, uh, like, like Boy Wonder's camp. Mm-hmm. A lot of Drake's music, a lot of Kendrick's music, and he's just really tapped in. We've been like, you know, working a lot more together now that we have so much more FaceTime, um, and uh, that's been great. Still, I do a lot of really cool collaborations and been able to be a part of uh, a lot of more, a lot of the R and B and pop music of today, which is fun. And you how know? did you get brought? Who brought you in? And how did you get pulled in on the Taylor Swift record? Oh, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, 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 yeah. He. Now, you know, we got this, we got this group text going, man. It's like me and, and Jahan and Enrique and my boy Ray. And like most of us went to school together, all best friends. And a lot of times we just send ideas and voice memos and stuff in there. And I think I sent him a, a voice memo a couple of years ago, you know, um, this stuff, sometimes this stuff takes time, but yeah, I sent him a voice memo that had then been flipped, manipulated, keys might've changed and ended up in, um, you know, a Taylor record, which is crazy. And Lavender Hayes. Tell me about that text thread. So you you'll what, <laughs> yeah. what will you throw at each other? Like how, how developed is the is a voice memo that you'll say? Is it just that acapella was, melody? That one was just me, just yeah, just just me and you know, a little keyboard, and that's all that one was. But a lot of the time, a lot of the time, it's honestly it's stuff he needs. Like yo, because anyone want to remake this guitar part? Does anyone want to do? Can anybody y'all throw horns on this? Like we just did some horns for John Batiste's new pro- like project, so he'll throw that in there. And then we just you know boom, drag in the logic, and I go track some horns real quick, send it back, and that's kind of how we just kind of keep things moving. And you never know what things might where things end up sometimes. Yeah, um, it's cool. It'll be cool. Like oh, my lawyer's about to hit you. Uh, but you know what I mean? And I'm like, okay, something might be happening. And that's kind of how it, how it, it goes. But we just try and hit each other back as soon as we can and, and, and yeah. throw ideas out there. Sometimes it's song ideas. And sometimes, like you said, a lot of time it's from his camp where he needs things done. And we're just like, just be on, go. be available, be ready for it. Pretty much, pretty much. You know, it's so, funny when we were talking earlier about like all the saxophone stuff, the Brecker stuff and the, you know, Grover Washington and the sound of you know Dave, you didn't say it but Dave Sanborn was very active in the eighties and pop music. Oh yeah, also, for sure, you know, for sure. And, Dave Sanborn, yeah. And even Phil Woods is on some big hit records yeah, in the seventies. Old record, crazy. Phil. there would be the spot for the saxophone solo on a lot of hit songs. Definitely. But now there's the way the horns are interacting. I mean, you know, maybe you could look at Roy Hargrove as an example of, of one sort of school, but then in LA also that it seems like the saxophone has become sort of like the, the texture that gets thrown on a lot of records now where it's like the yeah. layered saxophone vibe. And that's my thing, man. Yeah. I've been doing that a lot. Uh, I even have a splice pack that ended up doing pretty well. Oh, cool. with uh, Just, 
yeah, saxophone stacks, you know, I think it's called Brax stacks, but yeah, that's something I did like years ago. And it's just been a texture on a lot of my records where I'm like, I'll just stack chords like this and yeah. then play on it. Even my tiny desk, you can see I did some of that live, but like, it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really, it's a really cool, warm texture, like you said. And it's, yeah. um, it is cool that it's becoming more prevalent. And as far as the solo is concerned, I would love to see more of that come back, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see with time. I guess, you know, I there was a time where it was decidedly uncool to put a saxophone solo on a mainstream record. Like it just, it, it went to a thing where it was like, no, we don't do that anymore after having been done so much. Yeah, yeah. And I was always so me- upset about it when people would like laugh at the saxophone in popular music. I just think it got taken so far it did. It did. It's been parodied to a to a degree that's like almost too much, especially yeah. like the George Michael joint. Uh, the was we are them from we are them from that joint. Yeah. It's been parodied to a point where it, to some sometimes it can be a, a, a joke, but it's like no, nah, we got to just rebrand that and, and, yeah. and, and try, try and bring that one back because. Yeah. The horn solo is fire. I'm certainly hearing a lot more trumpet. I think it's like a lot of Latinx music is starting to become really mm. popular. I'm seeing a lot more of that. And my boy Enrique has played with uh, some really cool artists and stuff yeah. uh, in that way. So that that's dope too. I'm starting to hear more, you know, a lot of trumpet. Um, and Afrobeat has a lot of saxophone. I've, I've been hearing, you know, more of that. It's just little saxophone parts and stuff yeah, totally. in some of that music. So that's cool, you know. Overall, make it to be just to, to, to just hear horns and natural instruments like that's what i want to be a part of like that it's important it's important that people hear that but people yeah, young kids grow up knowing what these instruments are and what they sound like i think it's you know you know i don't want people to forget that well i so. think in a way that is part of you know you talked your freudian slip earlier about responsibility you know i mean yeah. one of the pieces of the puzzle for you seems mm-hmm. to be that you are going to be an advocate for playing an instrument yeah. well and you might people might discover you eventually through your songs you know but yeah. then when they see you pick up the instrument and play it it could be exposure for the first time even for people to see an instrument played like that i feel exactly that like, no matter what not i've certainly have had execs and people a and r's and people like man maybe you should just sing just do you and the guitar i'm like no man like there's going to be a saxophone solo and i don't care if it gets less listens or it's not going to get played on whatever because it's so yeah, that's my little stubborn part of my personality, probably. But I think yeah, because that's just important to me—the real instrument, the solo, the information, the history—and I think through my playing, because that's what I I lead with. I'm like that will be there, yeah. Regardless of whether something's going to be a bigger, get more numbers because there's less instruments or something, and uh, mm-hmm. right, the fewer instruments, the more numbers you get. Is that that's or I should say more <laughs> in- instrumental solos? I mean, yeah. you could have a lot of instruments, yeah. but more so like the solos. People think yeah. like people people tune out at this point. Yeah. Or, oh, this solo is too long. Why don't you cut this out? I'm like, no, let it rock. Well, are you into that whole thing? That whole shorter songs, TikTok streaming, like this become a thing where I, people are making songs shorter because they don't need them to be long. I know that's true. Uh, to a degree, I went. I got, I think I was like, all right, eight minute songs, maybe more like four or five. Yeah. But that's just, but that's just been like, all right, we don't need to take three choruses on this tune. Like even my records, like no doubt. I remember being in the studio, being like, all right, that was fire, but like let's do one chorus one chorus yeah and now and oftentimes that's all you really need to say yeah on the record and then let's go off live yeah and people can pull up to the show and like oh you know you know what i mean yep yeah for um, sure and miles was even about that it's like now that the record's kind of a promo in a way it's like this is like promotion for this for the you know i don't need to go crazy i'm gonna state the melody keep it moving yep yeah and and remember that you know to a certain degree you put on a record because you want to have a nice time listening to the record you know yeah and capture the mood right and because because i'm emotion based i'm like no let me get the point across yeah you know get the mood and the melody and the point across yeah and then you know and cut out whatever else almost like it very much like an essay anything that's too extraneous that i think isn't serving the thesis statement yes that makes sense you know what i'm saying it totally makes sense that that really right. makes sense yeah exactly mm-hmm. what is not serving this idea we have an idea here we're trying to a- accomplish does this serve that or not you know yeah exactly you get it yeah that's all um yeah why mm-hmm. what is the title who are you when no one is watching what, what like what what does that refer to on one level like i said just wanting to share more of who i am where i come from 
Um, so it's and, who am I when nobody's watching? Yeah, yeah, that right. That was really what prompted. Yeah, as a question to myself, yeah. almost, you know what I mean, an introspective kind of th- conversation. Uh, that was what prompted it, you know, and and what I feel comfortable sharing and what I don't. And then it kind of led to like a in the social media age that we live in. This you know, everyone, you know, tends to kind of curate who they are. Um, is just very interesting. And I've noticed a lot of just like a, a separation, even like people I've met that are, you know, have a lot of following, have a large following, act a certain way online and be sometimes completely different. And I'm like, oh, well, that's fascinating. Um, you know, this this whole concept of almost like having like a, uh, avatars and or just, just different parts of your personality. I've always tried to just portray myself as like who I am and the values that I value and, you know, really try and, show those and display those up so obviously you're not going to see every facet of who you are online but the things that are important you know shouldn't be like the opposite of who you really are you know what i'm saying right and uh, i'm seeing more of more of that and that's been fascinating so i'm just like look this is a weird time we're in i want to just be as honest and transparent as possible yeah you know what i mean um particularly in this tiktok era it's just interesting how do you deal with it how do you manage social media and and what did like is that part of your mm-hmm. your um discipline is that part of your routine like okay i gotta deal with the horn a little bit i gotta deal with some re- you know record release <laughs> stuff i gotta like write a song i'm on this text thread with my friends about production and and also i need and to make sure I sp- raise your child re- and like, yeah and I'm, I'm also yes I'm raise, a- yeah yeah and we're like part-time for the most part like we only yeah. have daycare like that's why it's a, i do my interviews monday wednesday friday because tuesday thursday we're pretty much at home so yeah trying to get everything done in a three-day period is wild but i'll say um it's still not as high on, it's not that high on the priority list, but it's getting, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm seeing like, this is just for the, as, as we get older and the generations just start to, you know, like it's a way to just kind of stay connected um, and, and, and trying to find like maybe fun in it and joy and, and trying to make things work within these confines is interesting, I guess. Uh, so yeah, no, I, I'm still wrapping my mind around it because it's constantly, it's constantly changing, but I'll say, uh, I, I think I like to, I like, I feel most comfortable probably posting and sharing like performance stuff and then uh, just kind of highlights of just what, whatever's happening in, in life. But uh, as far as TikTok is concerned, like, woof, I don't know, trying to, trying to, trying to figure it out, bro, trying to figure it out, you know, no real judgment on it. I just, just, just trying to, to understand it and how to operate because evolution is this naturally part of this game and, and we will always be affected by, by tech. And that's just kind of what it is. So I'm trying to figure figure that out and stay and stay who I am. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, as they say in the in the video for '90s, he says, "You've got the phone, and it's connected to the technology." You know, we've all got our phone connected <laughs> yeah. to the technology. Exactly. That's, exactly. We, we want to stay connected to it. Or Masego was hilarious. He it, was very funny. Out. You so you have this thing you say to Masego at the beginning of that video where he says I'm gonna bring a girl over to the to the house and you said I, <laughs> she's not the one with the bad teeth. Why well, you not bringing Cassandra with the busted teeth? Are you, bro? No, no, I'm not bringing her. She's, she's new. And she's very nice. Oh no, 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 she's not a dentist. Oh yeah, that's just a bunch of random improvs we did. That was like we did ten takes of that. It was just stupid. But I read an interview with you in 2014 where you were asked what would you do if you weren't a musician and you said yeah, and I you said it. orthodontist yeah i did t- i it's true and i was like there's a teeth thing going on there's like a he's so thinking about teeth i am it's probably one of the first things i noticed yeah that's nuts <laughs> that's crazy i always been into that i don't know why yeah man just like bicuspids and all yeah all the, the premolars i i've been into i don't know don't know why that stuff is always stuck with me. Is this real? Because uh, when I read that, I was like, I feel like he just chose just a random answer, just like a ridiculous uh, yeah, answer. No, nah, nah, I was dead serious. Like if it, it, that would be it. <laughs> that, that's it. Orthodontist. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. What. I, I dig it. I mean, I think it's good to know, like what you know, what it would be. Because I feel like I'll tell you, I got to the point in my life where I said to my wife, I would probably even get a job right now if I thought I was qualified for anything other than what I have been doing. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. Practically. No, I'm not going back to school for 80 years or whatever, but that's another interest I could, I'd say I'm like, yeah, I think I could, I could get into it. Yeah. So do you think now that you're so focused on your solo project, how do you think about integrating 
collaborations with other artists like you've done for so long. Yeah, on like like so like the touring front, you mean? Yeah, yeah, the touring thing. Ooh, that with the family, I, it, it it has to just make sense. It's case by case. Like Marquise, uh, we've been talking about like yeah, when he wants to do his next project and and maybe wants to tour, we'll figure that out. It's gonna be case by case. Like yeah, even now I set up my tour, so it's like I'm doing a West Coast leg, then a break. So I'm just not gone for long periods of time in the East Coast. So like we, I go out March 2nd on tour and we go to like the 12th, take a break, mm-hmm. pick back up in April, mm-hmm. East Coast, yep. break, pick back up. Yep. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, just how I'm making it work for, for me and my family. Yes. And myself. So it's not so crazy. Yes. Uh, probably more expensive to not, you know, to, to, to spread it out like that, but it is what it is. Uh, that's what I think we need to do. So to answer your question, like on the touring front, I think, it's just really case by case, but I would do, I would go out for a week or two with a couple guys and yeah. then come on back home and, and, yeah. and still do that. But most of my collaborations are just studio wise. Yeah. Like, like you're sending me, you know, things to lay saxophone on, or I'm pulling up to the studio to go lay a solo or yeah. whatever. You're so um, LA, I, man. Look at you. I you're know, so LA. I, I know. I know. Um, yeah. Like Rem- Andrew Rimpro has got an album. He's what he wants this next project he wants to work on. So February 27th, we're going to hit the studio out here. Yep. So I've done some rehearsals with him and same with Pinson and my boys. Like, yeah, I'm going to play on all of my friends' records and we're going to do that. But yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, Braxton, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you and, and thank you for getting real with me a little bit and for sharing the whole story and talking about the record. It's, it's really a treat. Yeah, thank you, bro. It's great to meet you, man. There he was, my friends, Braxton Cook. What a beautiful guy. I'll be back again in your headspace with another deep dive before you know it. Until then, I'll talk to you soon. This has been a WBGO Studios production. To learn more about WBGO Studios' award-winning podcasts, special concerts, live streams, and more, visit wbgo.org studios.